Um, so the next speaker is Emily Park, who's a final year PhD student at the University of Nottingham. And she's going to talk to us about broadly neutralising bovine antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. OK, um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Isabel said, I'm Emily Park and I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Nottingham. And I'm here to talk to you today about the discovery of broadly neutralising bovine monoclonal antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. So as we know, SARS-CoV-2 evolved and is still evolving to evade our immune responses. And this has led to a lot of shortfalls in our therapeutics. For example, we've had loss of efficacy from our therapeutic maps. And as we can see here, most of the licensed maps that are currently approved show a marked reduction in their performance, specifically against these newer variants of Omicron. So, of course, as well as monoclonal antibodies, we have our antivirals. However, these are most effective when delivered at a specific time to reduce peak viral load, and they're heavily reliant on rapid diagnostics with a low level of detection. And these are more considered as a short-term therapeutic rather than long-term. So there's been a massive search for broadly neutralizing antibodies that can retain and um, continue their performance against these newer variants. And in this search for broadly neutralizing antibodies, there's been an interest in um, bovine ultralong antibodies. So as we know from the antibody structure, we can see that we have the fragment antigen binding region, FAB, and the fragment crystallizable region, FC. Of the FAB, we have this variable region and a constant region. And of this he heavy chain, we have what's called complementary determining regions, CDRs, one to three flanked by framework. So with these CDR threes of the heavy chain, so CDR H3, we can have these long paratope structures. And this has been found in species such as chicken, bovine, um, camelids, sharks, but we rarely see this in humans. And these long CDR H3s have been associated with breadth and binding to their target antigens. Today, the longest human antibody, it's called PG16, has a CDR H3 of 28 amino acids. And it's come from a donor, um, an African donor that had a HIV infection for at least three years. This kind of suggests that these structures take very long time to form in humans. So what's really interesting is that bovine have this unique ability to generate um, these really ultra long antibodies. And they've diverged away from these standard mechanisms of antibody diversity. And they compensate, as I said, by this ultra long CDRH3 region, which can range up to 70 amino acids in length. And this forms these unique paratope structures where you have a knob here that's supported by a stalk. And they've been known to bind to challenging viral agents. For example, there was a bovine ultra long antibody um, that was known to neutralize 72% of cross clade HIV isolates with a potent median IC50 of 28 nanograms per mil. So at the University of Nottingham, we began immunizing cows with SARS CoV 2 lineage A um, spike antigens. And using flow cytometry, we sorted um, single reactive B cells. Immunoglobulin heavy and light chains were retrieved with PCR, and we cloned this into a human antibody cassette and expressed in mammalian cells. However, sadly, we noticed that there was a reduced expression in our ultralong antibodies, and so we sought different alternative methods in which we could use these. And this is where my project came in for my PhD, where I looked at using phage display as this alternative screening method. So phage display is the generation of a library of a diverse phage clone population, whereby each clone carries a unique foreign segment of DNA, and this results in its expression on its surface. To date, 14 marketed therapeutic maps have been either discovered or modified through phage display. The most common one that you probably may have heard of is adalimumab, which is used against inflammatory diseases such as Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. So what I did here is I displayed a bovine fab ultra long library on the M13 bacteriophage minocote protein P3. And so we carried out two rounds of biopanning. And biopanning is where you're washing this library over an immobilized target so that you can enrich those clones that have high affinity. So I carried out two rounds of panning, first against lineage A trimer and the second against BA5 trimer. And on validating this library, I identified two phage clones of interest P2 that showed potent binding to lineage A and P7 phage, and this one 
bound to, bound to both targets. So although the knob, as I explained, can actually function independently, we know that FC receptor functions are important. So we cloned this into um, a human FC construct, which allowed us to produce chimeric full IgG maps. And what was really exciting about this is that we, got, we obtained high yields of these ultra long maps. So there must be something in the phage display that we thought may select for these, high, um, these well expressing antibodies. So from this, we combined our results from both the single cell sorting and the phage display, and we generated a panel of 33 maps, 21 of which bound to the, um, to the trimer, um, but 13 of them were non-ultra long and eight were ultra long. So we were classing ultra long here as anything above 50 amino acids in the CDR3. As you can see, there was variability across the panel um, to different SARS-CoV-2 antigens. However, we had three that were of interest, um, two through the phage display and one through the single cell sorting. And these were of interest because they bound to every target that we had with sub-micromolar um, EC50s. So we began our characterization of these maps with in vitro, um, first starting off with pseudovirus neutralization assays. And from this, the most potent binding was MAB P2. But sadly, when we got the emergence of BA5, completely abolished its neutralization. And we also noticed that it did not also neutralize SARS-CoV-1. MAB99, on the other hand, was also a potent neutralizer of all SARS-CoV-2 variants. However, again, did not um, neutralize SARS-CoV-1. Uh, SARS so then we look at P7, and P7 was less potent. However, it neutralized all of the SARS-CoV-2 variants and also as well um, pseudoviruses of um, SARS-1. So we took forward MAP P7 and MAP99, and we carried out live virus neutralization, which largely reflected what we were seeing in the pseudovirus data. And so we continue to characterize these antibodies. So from our ongoing characterization, we carried about um, SARS-CoV-2 virus RBD binding because we wanted to see the extent of um, P7, what it could bind to. And from here, these all that are highlighted are ones that we tested, um, RBDs that we tested. And from what you can see with P7 is that it bound to everything that we tested. And that was across three Sarbic virus plates. Whilst characterizing P7, we carried out in vivo neutralization on MAP99, and it was shown to be protective in hamsters. And this was shown by maintenance of weight and also as well reduced viral load in the lung compared to controls. Um, we're planning actually future experiments at the moment of MAP P7 and 99 um, in vivo um, models. Um, and we're planning on doing this against the more pathogenic strain Delta. So we also as well got in touch with collaborators at Caltech and they've been carrying out some structural studies for us so we can unveil the modes of binding of these antibodies. And from initial studies, we can see that MAB P2 bound to two monomers of the trimer, whereas MAB99 bound to all three. And we're still currently waiting on a structure for MAB P7. But what was really great is how this was supported by our um, FabMab competition ELISA data. So we were detecting the MAB here. So any Im um, impact in the binding we'd see would drop below 100%. Obviously, against it, the MAB against itself would obviously drop as it competed for the same site. However, we did not see from MAB99 to P2. And again, if we see down here, there, we did not see any competition suggesting that these have their own unique sites. And the same as we can see from MAB P7, we were expecting that with the crystal structure, it would be binding in a completely unique epitope. So what's really, really exciting about this study is that the cows were immunized and only witnessed lineage A trimer, and they didn't even see SARS-CoV-1. So we've got a therapeutic here that could be um, used in potential towards future pandemics. So I wanted to give thanks especially to the University of Nottingham, especially um, Theo, Josh and Joe, who are very much involved in the single B cell sorting, the University of Liverpool for all their work with the live virus models and our collaborators at Caltech and Cornell University for the structural studies. Thank you for listening. Any questions?
this one here. Great, uh, uh, fantastic presentation. And obviously I'm aware through discussing with Richard how those benefits of the of the bovine antibody um, uh, trump many other antibodies. We we specialize more in nanobodies in, in our approach, but we're looking at the S2 uh, region, which is uh, uh, home to less potent neutralizing and uh, epitopes, but ones that are maybe more conserved. So, wondering if you'd tried your uh, bovine antibodies to target S2, and also going forward, uh, how do you envisage this um, this product uh, going as a uh, prophylactic or as a therapeutic? Will it be one mono one one antibody, or are you think looking more like a, a cocktail of antibodies? Yeah, so to, to answer your first question, we haven't looked towards the S2. We sorted this specifically on the trimer. Um, so, again, that's another option that we can do, obviously, and try to pull out some ultra-long antibodies to that. Obviously, I was only focusing on the trimer for my study, and that's taken me about four years. So <laughs> there is plenty of work to be done here, and we also immunise the cows against other viral agents as well. So there is a lot of work to be done. We look across the board. There's polyreactive clone, like this, the sura is very, very reactive and responsive, and I believe it is responsive as well to S2, so it would be useful trying to pull those out. Um, going forward, obviously, a lot of the data that we've shown is very like preliminary. It's um, we've looked mainly at obviously the binding when we look at the Sarbecca virus side of things. So obviously, we don't know whether this confers to neutralization. So we'd first want to attempt at looking that. And then again, like I said, the in vivo studies to make sure that it actually confers across to in vivo neutralization. Um, in terms, though, if this was all successful, um, taking this forward, obviously, it's bovine, so it's immunogenic. So we really want to reduce that, especially if it's to be used as, say, prophylactic use or as therapeutic use. So we've actually looked at potentially cloning just the CDR3 into a fully humanized um, cassette. But obviously, we have to make sure that it's probably got a germline that can support such structures, because that's obviously the issue, that they're very, very complex structures that they're forming. So it might be the case that when we graft it, it does not work. Um, so the idea of something like, say, um, PG-16, maybe looking at that germline, they seem to support human longer CDR3s. So perhaps there's a chance there that in grafting it into that, it will be able to work. But again, like I said, it works again, similarly as the knob by itself. So as a one-off treatment, I believe that this wouldn't be as immunogenic, but obviously if you wanted to give repeated dosages, then yes, you'd have to look at reducing its immunogenicity. Um, in terms of... Um, your last question about combining the two antibodies together. The whole point of the bovine ultra long antibodies is the idea that you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to do this cocktail of antibody, um, which obviously can get quite expensive. And even though we've seen as well with some of the cocktails like Renkov 2, um, that's not actually um, been as effective against newer variants. So it's the idea that maybe we can get this one antibody that does everything really. That's the kind of the long shot, the golden dream really.